and uh, that includes, let's say, budget monitoring. Um, that has an interesting parallels in Indian context. The Kisan Mazdoor Shakti Sangatan in Rajasthan used uh, like such analysis uh, uh, using the uh, uh, access to information uh, and using uh, public uh, hearings. And uh, they have been able to nail corruption. They have been able to uh, nail uh, uh, squandering away of public funds. Uh, there's a lot that can be done by NHRIs by building alliances with uh, civil society, by building alliances with other anti-corruption agencies, by uh, forging uh, uh, um, uh, partnerships with media and using uh, new technologies. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, about a, uh, two decades back, uh, the Human Rights Watch brought out a, uh, a compilation. Uh, they made a study of about 25 odd institutions, NHRIs in the African context. And it is called Protectors or Pretenders, uh, a study of the NHRIs in Africa. So uh, the moment you recognize uh, um, the corruption-free administration as a human right, uh, the NHRIs needs to take proactive steps. And uh, um, take, in fact, uh, uh, they, can, uh, they have a role to uh, um, identify systemic issues and also address individual complaints and also take up law reform uh, and also uh, legislative reform. Now, Magdalena, of course, comes out with a, a small caution. And she, um, while on one hand acknowledging the role of NHRIs in the fight against corruption, she uh, has uh, suggested that it can be used against political opponents. Uh, human rights uh, have a political dimension, and uh, often uh, um, one can, uh, uh, let's say, uh, use it against the political opponents. Uh, for instance, in India, uh, when um, the anti-terrorist laws have some uh, have been misused against, let's say, environmental activists, trade union activists, so it's very important. While uh, uh, we recognize. Uh, that NHRIs have a role in the fight against corruption. Uh, it, it's also uh, um, important to, uh, uh, in, to ensure that it's not misused against the political opponents. I now turn to um, another article on the law of the sea and internationally protected human rights. Uh, here again, uh, is there any uh, relationship between the law of the sea and internationally protected human rights? Uh, is there any uh, uh, conflict between them? Or uh, uh, how uh, uh, can they uh, interact with each other? Uh, does the uh, international human rights law framework need to learn any lessons from the law of the sea regime or not? Uh, Lucius Kauflich has um, uh, taken up a few cases that had gone to the European Court of Human Rights as uh, uh, you know, human rights uh, belong to everyone, uh, uh, regardless of the fact whether a person is rich or a poor, whether a person is a good or bad, whether a person is a drug trafficker or otherwise, uh, uh, whether a person is uh, 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 a terrorist or not. Uh, so they belong to everyone. So that having been said, um, you have the provision in most national constitutions and also in the European Convention of Human Rights on uh, right to uh, personal uh, liberty and freedom. Uh, in other words, you know, if you look at uh, Article 5 of the European Convention of Human Rights, it says, uh, anyone who has been arrested uh, shall be produced before a judicial authority promptly, and uh, he shall be uh, uh, entitled to be tried within a reasonable time or to release pending trial. And the release may be conditioned by guarantees to appear for trial. Uh, using uh, four uh, uh, cases that had gone before the European Court of Human Rights at Strasbourg, uh, a few points had been, uh, very interesting points had been made by Lucius uh, Kaflich. Um, I'd like to uh, refer to uh, some details. Uh, Rigo Paulus versus Spain, 
here, uh, here is a, uh, Rico Polis was a drug trafficker and he was sailing in a ship, Archelangelos. The ship was, uh, uh, it's a vessel from uh, flying uh, Panamian uh, flag and uh, cargo uh, was suspected to be uh, 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 cocaine. And uh, the Spanish authorities uh, came to know about it and they accosted uh, uh, in mid seas about 5,500 kilometers away from Spain and it was, this vessel was headed towards Europe and, uh, and they not only accosted, they confiscated the material, they uh, held the persons uh, 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 captive and then uh, eventually uh, um, they detained them for 16 days and before uh, uh, they were presented uh, before a judicial authority. And here, uh, the Spanish uh, courts tried them and convicted them, and they later on appealed to the European Court of Human Rights, and European Court of Human Rights after going through all the, uh, 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 what do you call, um, relevant legal provisions. Huh? Uh, in fact, if you see, um, generally in normal cases, a person who is arrested is supposed to be produced within 24 hours of arrest, and before a judicial authority, an impartial judicial authority. And in cases of uh, terrorists, what ought to be the limit? In case of drug traffickers, what ought to be this limit? So these are questions. Uh, should this be interpreted uh, with flexibility, or should they be interpreted uh, very strictly? And if a drug trafficker uh, were to be accosted high seas, should he or she be airlifted uh, in order to uh, meet the requirements of uh, uh, prompt trial. Uh, so in fact, there are minority judgments in this particular case also suggested that uh, these people be uh, airlifted. Uh, uh, but uh, the majority opinion said no, and they harmonize uh, the requirements of the, uh, uh, both the Convention on the Law of the Sea along with human rights and they felt that uh, uh, um, uh, safeguarding the procedural rights of traffickers is not uh, uh, as important as uh, of fighting uh, illegal drug trafficking effectively. And uh, in another case uh, also, uh, uh, they took uh, uh, a similar view. There was one case where from Libya, a ship has uh, set off uh, uh, towards France and again, it was in the mid seas, and there was a humanitarian catastrophe, and the ship was about to uh, submerge. And here, uh, the, they were rescued mid seas, and then uh, those people who rescued them have again turned them back to their uh, uh, original country. And here again, uh, the persons who were rescued and then turned back to their uh, uh, country of origin. Uh, took their case to the European Court of Human Rights, and there again, uh, uh, um, the court uh, 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 leaned in favor of the country, and the, the defense taken by the uh, court was that uh, they don't want to do anything which will deter uh, a future, uh, uh, like such humanitarian uh, help or uh, in the mid seas. Uh, there's one more case where uh, there was a vessel in the mid seas and it was carrying uh, uh, petroleum and there was a spill uh, very close to the coast and uh, it was a huge ecological uh, disaster and uh, the, per the person responsible uh, for the ship was uh, uh, arrested uh, promptly by uh, uh, Spain and he was brought to trial and the court uh, uh, laid down a, a huge bail requirement of uh, about 3 million euros. This case again was taken to the uh, European Court of uh, uh, Human Rights at Strasbourg and uh, the court also, uh, the, here again the court uh, uh, laid down that uh, um, this 3 million euros bail was indeed justified. Now, let me turn to the third article of uh, Humphrey uh, Stipala, bridging the business and human rights divide with the lessons from the UNCLOS 
deep sea mining regime. Uh, do business enterprises have any human rights obligations? This question uh, for long agitated many, and initially it was believed that uh, they do not have any human rights obligation, but this changed over years. And the US Secretary General's representative, John Draghi, uh, came out with a framework. Uh, it's a three-pronged framework of um, protect, respect, and remedy. And uh, of course, the UN is yet to operationalize it, and the steps are on. So this is, on the one hand, the uh, uh, human rights regime. On the other hand, uh, there's a lot to learn from the UNCLOS regime, uh, which you know uh, was clarified by the Seabed Dispute Chamber. It flows from the recognition of the uh, deep sea mining area as the common heritage of humanity. When we consider the precautionary principle, when we consider the intergenerational equity, uh, the common seabed has been recognized as a, uh, uh, a common uh, heritage of the humanity, and thus uh, it protected them from the corporate entity against you know, uh, um, unregulated uh, exploitation. And uh, so in short, uh, um, these are the three articles which relate to human rights, and uh, all of them uh, have uh, dealt with uh, this issue in uh, the thing. And uh, there is, of course, an article by Elizabeth Griffin on the role of um, uh, uh, international human rights law teacher. It is, thank you. Hello. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll uh, mainly deal with the teaching part, te teaching as international law part uh, dealt with in the book. There are mainly two papers, and for certain reasons, I have chosen the paper by Juan A. Amaya Castro. The primary reason why I have chosen this paper is this paper poses a question which is both existential and epistemological. It's existential for the professors of international law, and it's also, it also deals with the larger epistemology of international law. The author in the paper poses a paradox, which he calls the, the paradox of emplacement, which a public international law professor faces. And he proposes at the end of the paper a formula to overcome the paradox. And I personally believe that Professor Gudmundur Eriksson is the best manifestation of the formula which the author has proposed in the paper. First of all, let me talk a little bit about this emplacement paradox. It poses the primary question, is international law place-based? Can international law be lo locally contextualized? Or whether international law should retain the internationalness, which is typical to the international law? So most of the professors, especially professors whom we can call the ivory tower theoreticians, or the professors who are born and brought up in the epistemology of international law, generally would love to present international law as a socio-political discourse rather than trying to contextualize international law within a specific occurrence. However, when they teach international law, when they teach international law in a class, they have to locate international law in a certain context. They have to give examples. They have to teach cases. So this actually brings in a certain kind of emplacement to international law. And emplacement runs quite counter to the very ontology of international law, which is actually a delocalized Pan global discipline. So first of all, the author says that what are these place-basedness in international law? He brings in a few examples. So one such example is when they ask a question like, what happened in Gaza? And when the professor tries to explain what happens in Gaza, the professor is unknowingly localizing international law. He's contextualizing international law. He is falling into the trap of emplacement which international law has laid. Second, when we talk about the local implementation of international law, there is a reference to the place. And third, when we talk about the local concerns transcending to the transnational, automatically there is a reference to the local. In fact, ontologically, this defies the very philosophy of international law, or rather this defies the very ontology of international law, that international law is a discipline which has to be taught through its internationalness. Uh, it should not be confined to any space or any time. Interestingly, uh, international law does not 
function in any specific geography. Rather, it's the belief that international law functions in a meta geography, which we call the transnational. So whenever the local law transcends, it assumes the character of international law. So transnational is a meta geography on which international law generally functions. And we have the examples of United Nations, European Union, a treaty. These are the examples of the transnational. Apart from that, opinion Juris is formed in transnational. Consensus is formed in transnational. So in fact, international law is a discipline which takes pride for its very, uh, uh, very, very pan-global existence, for its very transnational existence. So any effort by a law professor, any effort by a law professor to contextualize international law within a place defies the very ontology of the discipline. Place comes in various manifestations. I've already given a few examples, uh, uh, drawn on the order. Another example is The Hague. The Hague always is deemed as a global capital of international law. So there is a sense of place whenever, whenever there is a reference to The Hague by the professor of public international law. When we talk about Eurocentricism, Europe comes in as a nostalgia uh, uh, in the class of the public international law professor. Apart from that, there is also a non-Euclidean sense of space. We talk about center and peripheries, north and the south, east and the west, and first and the third world. So all this literally gives a sense of space uh, to, another, uh, to, to a discipline which is otherwise ontologically, uh, uh, I mean, unspatial or rather despatial. And Amaya Kasparov presents this as a paradox because how the professor is going to teach international law? Is he going to contextualize international law without losing its ontological character of uh, pan-global or should he focus only on the, 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 the contextualizing? So first of all, international law has to be taught as a theory and uh, doctrine. Now, the theory and doctrine about how law functions in the international society. But the very moment the professor will start to speak about how law functions in the international society, the professor will have to talk about international law occurring somewhere, in some space. Again, the sense of space recurs in the minds of the students and the professor. Also, the sense of emplacement, the sense of the place comes many times not in a neutral fashion. That when we talk about the place, some places are good places, some places are bad places. United States is a bad place, as far as United States as a state is concerned. Some states are compliant good states. We also, uh, when we talk about the compliance of international law, we, we still talk about compliance by certain states which are normative and compliance by certain states which are rational. In fact, it's hard for a professor to break this ambivalence of the place and also the ambivalence uh, that is posed to by the transnational, which defies, uh, sorry, the, the transnational, which ought to be the ontological mode of international law. Now, the main question is how to teach international law. And Amaya Castro proposes a solution here. He says that international law has to be taught through the trap of uh, emplacement, right? It has to be taught through the place of emplacement. So he says that one need not, one need not try to transcend or overcome the emplacement approach, but yet, in order not to lose the ontological character of international law, international law has to be taught also as uh, the theory and doctrine, the pan-global existence. If international law is taught in the manner an ivory tower theoretician teaches international law, international law will be disjointed from the mundane life. And if international law is taught through contexts, through occurrences, then international law will lose its ontological character. So, uh, Amaya Castro suggests a formula here. He says that there, there has to be a bottom-up approach, an integrative approach that international law has to be taught through how it occurred. Occurrences here can also be the various case laws. Occurrences can also be the application of international law in the local societies. And then one has to teach how the local application of international law transcended to the international realm. For an ivory tower theoretician, it's hard to articulate this fact. Here comes the relevance of uh, a judge turned professor, a diplomat turned professor who knows literally the occurrences in international law. Occurrences happen in the local sphere. So somebody who knows the occurrences, someone who knows the ground realities, and someone who knows how international law occurs in spaces, it's easier for them to, easier for them to articulate or speak how the international law transcends to the transnational, how the local occurrence gets a transnational character. And I'm sure that as Professor Gudmunder Eriksson um, as I've known through his students, has this quality that he is the manifestation of this formula of how a local occurrence ultimately transcends into the transnational phenomenon of international law. Now, the advantage is the ontological character of international law is retained, yet international law is taught as the law in context.
Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Katie. That was great. Um, I'll try to keep my comments brief. Um, firstly, I'm very honored to have been asked by Gurmundur and by Veslin to uh, present some work from the book. I must confess that I haven't had a chance to read the whole book. Um, but the chapter on history by James Crawford and um, Cameron Miles is the one that I will be speaking about. And I think that in some ways, this chapter is also the heart of this book um, from what I saw um, of the other chapters. It appears that someone mentioned in the introduction that all the chapters in this book have been very deliberately chosen. They're not here by accident. And they're not here because they couldn't find room elsewhere. They are uh, a deliberate and very moving tribute to um, the modern Renaissance man, um, who we have the pleasure and the honor to call our colleague. Um, in this chapter, James Crawford presents um, a very interesting problem. He problematizes the most seductive area of research in international law today, which is the task of writing histories of international law. And James Crawford, of course, places this um, in the second volume of the American Journal of International Law in 1908, when Lassa Oppenheim um, wrote what appeared to be a scholarly challenge. Um, and he said that the master historian of international law is yet to come. And Oppenheim lamented that the vast and profoundly important task of documenting the history of international law is an endeavor whose time has not yet come. And the endeavor remains unfulfilled because of spatial, um, to borrow from Strujit's um, presentation just now, spatial constraints on the imagination of what these histories might be. And Crawford presents um, a thesis where he says that there are three ways of looking at these histories, the narrative approach, the theoretical approach, and the political approach. And his thesis is that he proposes a fourth approach. So let me quickly um, summarize for you what Crawford understands to be the narrative approach, the theoretical approach, and the political approach. Crawford says that the narrative approach of writing histories of international law is the standard chronology of events. And he cites Nussbaum's um, seminal work, the, what is it called? Concise. The Concise History of International Law, as uh, the most important example of this. And the problem that he reveals with this is he talks about, they talk about, the authors talk about, um, how international law appears to unfold in a narrative account of it as if it is one unbroken conversation, as if it is one unbroken piece. And it embraces the voices of those who in that time are the most powerful articulators of the positions that they stand for, which then becomes international law as we see it. And the merit of this position is that it has a large number of takers and that people have attempted quite bravely to put forth many narratives of international law. And the narrative account of international law is poor because it discounts the break in the discipline. And there he talks about the job of those who, who have a more sophisticated, a more nuanced view of the discipline. And of course, he is talking about Marty Koskaniemi, his colleague, Professor Gudmundur Iverson's colleague, um, our mentors at the center. Um, and he says that Marty Koskiniemi's uh, work in chronicling the history of international law fills the gap created by the narrative approach and belongs to the theoretical approach. Because Koskiniemi is not chronicling um, international law as, as, a, as a journey from the Dark Ages and so forth, but as a study of concepts and occurrences. And so, you know, he takes an example of diplomatic immunity, for example, and studies how it emerged um, through history. Well, once again, though, the authors feel that there is a polarization of the voices that represent 
the theoretical approach. And by polarization, of course, uh, the language used by the authors is not so uh, polite. It says, one more damn European professor. Um, and um, that's in the text. Um, what he means is that Kostiniemi's paper about international law as German law and the emerging Eurocentric nostalgia or bias of the centers of international law and where international law is made, the institutions and the centers of production, reflects because the theoretical approach takes into account precisely those voices that come out of these institutions. And that's fair because those are the voices that came out. And then he turns to a third kind of telling of international law, through politics, where international law is a journey into the realities of international relations, articulated by convenient theory. And here he brings in uh, Gru and Kostiniemi, once again called the epochs of international law, Gru's uh, important work. And he talks about, well, um, how certain events in history were um, the watersheds of the building of a discipline, and how the discipline can be viewed in its entirety as a continuum spread across these moments in history, but that the authors and the architects of these moments in history were in fact sovereign states, institutions, actors, agents. And so the politics of international law far supervenes and subsumes the theory of it. And so international legal theory is less important than the practice of the law of nations. And finally, he says that, well, having analyzed these three ways of looking at history, I now propound the fourth way of looking at history. And I think that is where, um, that is why this fourth uh, proposition that the authors put is um, a direct tribute to Professor Eriksson, because he says that the fourth way of telling history is the professional method. And by that he means history told through the eyes of those who were the actors and the agents and the purveyors of the law that became international law. How did they see their role in the moment when it was their role to perform an activity? How did Professor Eriksson view the former that changed the face of Article 120 forever? How did Michael Wood and how did Sir Hirsch Lauterpacht view their role at the time that they had a role? And um, on an unbiased reading of, of this text, it would appear that the professional approach, if adopted, of course, I don't think that it's fair to say that there is no professional approach. All of the intellectual biographies that are being written and all of the um, attempts to tell history through the voice of people who were part of that history. This is all part of that process. And um, what the authors hope is that this will fill the, fill the gap for other voices in international law to be heard. And I think that um, there could be no more fitting tribute for someone like Judge Eriksson, Professor Eriksson, who has so many identities and who has watched the law of the sea as a discipline from scratch evolve and come to the point of MV North Star, where he's now sitting on the bench um, at it law. It would be fascinating to see what role he imagined for himself. And as students in his class, our students are audience and witness precisely to this quality of history that Crawford has put. Through his lectures, I'm sure, Professor Eriksson talks about what role he felt he was discharging at any given point in time. And a series of those lectures would be a professional history of the law of the sea. And I think that there is something very seductive and appealing um, about this tribute. And um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have been able to read it. Thank you so much for um, having me. Thank you, Rashmi. Uh, just to add to that, in, indeed, uh, James Crawford and Cameron Mouse is a core uh, part of this book. Uh, exactly, as it invites us to think about history in various ways, either through the individuals uh, or either through the concepts and ideas those individuals develop, or either through the 
connection between international law and politics. And interestingly, just mentioned, Rashmi and I are part of a project looking at the dawn of a discipline, meaning the international criminal law and its own. That would be exponent. And we, we are struggling exactly a little bit with the, the same dilemma. Shall we do uh, biographies and looking at how uh, Rappaport, Lemkin, uh, uh, and others, the Barber and uh, Pella, uh, as personalities develop their own ideas and what we can take as a history of Russian criminal law is how individuals who are part, the actors of the process. So, but I, I struggle a little bit with that because in particular Lemkin, uh, in fact, can manipulate himself, can be too narcissistic and can view things too subjectively and to lose the objective. So we, we were between somehow the four ways of thinking about history. Each of those have a very great value. And I guess it's combination, synthesis between the four ways is one way to avoid uh, uh, the subjectivity of it. Uh, and uh, just to add a few more chapters in, in the next few minutes, uh, and actually we, we, without actually planning, we did very well because we covered almost all the book. Following from uh, Crawford and uh, Miles on the history of development of well, what Two or three more chapters. Here one by Oliver Green of the Hamashal in, in the United Nations. An excellent chapter which uh, looks at the life of someone, the Hamashal, an individual, and how it reflected not only the United Nations but also the context of that time, the difficulty between the discipline itself, the fight between uh, realism and idealism, which the United Nations faces from day one, but also how, how that Hamashal uh, himself uh, being an idealist, believing in the high goals and principles of the United Nations Charter, had also to work uh, as a Secretary General in the realities of the day. And those realities were very harsh. It was the beginning of the Cold War, the negativism of the Soviet Union to international law, uh, the and not only the Soviet Union, it was also the time of the McCarthyism and anti-communism. So on one hand you have Stalin, on the other hand you have McCarthy, and how an organization can survive, how the independence of the international civil service can survive. And that Hamashal was part of that very difficult time, struggling to promote the ideals in a time of a very harsh reality. Again, bringing back Crawford and Marx, the politicization of international law, the thinking of international law as a role of the individual. And even with all those restrictions, Hammershaw, uh, I'm actually talking about the chapter of what we bring, not so much about my own experience here, is how uh, he could promote issues such as peacekeeping, such as uh, rule of law, uh, which are implicit and explicit uh, uh, values of, of the organization. How did he see the human security in addition to state security? How he could see the collective security including human dignity? And it's very early stage in the United Nations, so we really uh, very much obliged to the Hamashal uh, for, for those uh, innovations. Hans Corral, somebody I also had a good chance to meet and to work with at some point, is writing about the reforming of the United Nations Security Council. I must say, I must admit that I disagree with part of what Hans Corel said about that we should not think so much about the composition rather than about the working methods of the Council. In my writings, I more argue that there needs to be attention both to the composition and the representativeness of the Council, including in how to make the Council more effective. We cannot really divide the two. Uh, and Hans is very much a promoter of rule of law. We know that. He spent much of his time promoting the concept. He, he personally drafted some of the reports of the Secretary General on the rule of law and democracy. So he was a very strong advocate of the rule of law. And also, uh, he wanted to see the Security Council developing the thematic uh, debate that 
thematic agenda, and, and, and at the end of the day, the Security Council adopted thematic resolutions of uh, addressing the protection of civilians, women, uh, role in peace and security, children in armed conflict, anti terrorism, uh, non proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and so on. So, uh, Haas very well summarizes those in his uh, contribution to the Liberal Corps. And finally, Peter Tomka, and that's it to see someone who presented here in Jindal his view, and then he put them into a contribution to this uh, volume. The former president of the International Court of Justice, uh, Peter Tomka and Vincent Joe, who are writing about the evidentiary practice of the World Court, uh, the testimonial evidence and the expert witnesses, and how they can also be part of otherwise uh, a court that is supposed to not only resolve this, but also to offer legal opinions. And Tomka and, and uh, Pro here give two examples, the waiting in Antarctic case and the Serbia genocide case, and how did the ICJ deal with issues such as uh, evidentiary material, highly technical material, very cogently methodologically, in fact. They almost acted like a domestic criminal court in the sense of taking very seriously all the expertise, all the evidence. They look at the maps in boundary disputes, in photos, in small scale models, in recordings, films, audio visuals, and all other evidentiary practice. So, uh, really, an, an excellent contribution by Peter and Vincent John, evidentiary practice of the World Court. More work already addressed Magdalena's chapter on the role of the national human rights and institutions. Just to present quickly the rest of the chapters, it is also Joaquin Gonzalez Ibanez on the role of law, human rights, and transitional justice, international law setting parts of democratic standards and transitional justice processes, who refers to the rule of law as universal secular religion. Uh, the transitional justice comes very timely uh, somehow to add the what otherwise the law may miss is the maintenance in time of transition of the core value validity and respect of human rights, of the role of law, of democracy, and so on. And uh, Joaquin Gonzalez also invites us to think creatively and to think of law as norms only doesn't help to understand the legal system. So international law is uh, special in a sense of its uh, relevance to also international politics and all other subjects. And uh, the chapter also referred to the last case, Rodriguez case in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, looking at the obligation of states, not only to human rights, but also to transitional justice. So the link between transitional justice and human rights also involves to the Reconciliation commissions, how important is also history, commemorations, common narrative about the past, uh, restrictions, uh, reparations, institutional reform, and all other parts of uh, transitional justice. So it's not only the law, but also the transitional justice, as the judges in the last century, as uh, to address the integrity. Uh, finally, there are chapters by uh, Craig and Tony Brannigan. I must admit I couldn't read the, them. Uh, it's my next week instead of playing tennis. I will I'll have some more work to do. Because uh, it's a huge book. It cannot be really read in one. It, it, every chapter needs its own uh, uh, time to be uh, read and reflected upon. Uh, but Craig Anthony wrote on border disputes, ceasefires, and power sharing, lessons in diplomacy. Rafael Camulli wrote on the jurisprudential scope of the doctrine of control over the crime of the general statute. And finally, Linus uh, Malo wrote on the International Criminal Court and the peace processes in Cote d'Ivoire and Mali. And all of these are really excellent pieces, and I'm very much looking forward to read the book and to comment. And we need more time. We need to reflect on such magnum opus in, in the next weeks and months. I, I strongly recommend by the, by the book to be read by students 
and to be made as their desk book. Uh, it's not only about international law, uh, law of the sea, but also about the law in general. There are chapters that will really bring students into the latest uh, modern technology, the modern man, such as Ericsson. So, my uh, thanks to our panelists today, and my pleasure to give Eric uh, Goodman his uh, time to uh, tell us uh, his uh, uh, feeling. How do I feel? I feel, of course, very warm. Professor Wesselin shared with me this morning the, um, the, the, the 13 criteria for a, a successful freshship for Libra on the forum. And I agree with him that at least nine, in my opinion, were fully fulfilled, um, including the one about the, um, uh, about the photograph. It should be at least, uh, I think, 15 years old. And uh, if you look at this picture, you'll see that this uh, certainly complies with that uh, criterion. It's a 15 years, at least. Um, but secondly, uh, one of the, the criterion which is not uh, met <coughs> is that one's supposed to be surprised uh, when one is uh, presented a volume like this. And I cannot really pretend to be surprised uh, <coughs> because, uh, first of all, uh, as you mentioned, three of my, you know, my children are very closely involved with it, and it's been quite some time, so I know they've been very, I've been really sort of obsessed uh, with this thing. Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, I cannot really uh, expect you to believe me when I say that I'm surprised. But I am surprised, and maybe, well, maybe not surprised, maybe I would say flabbergasted at the quality of the work. I could never in my, you know, my life imagine that I would see such a, such a work so rich in contribution, and <coughs> with um, uh, in the, you know, the, the production is absolutely fantastic. And uh, I won't have a chance to, it'll take me some time to thank uh, the contributors <coughs> and the uh, editorial uh, board, because while well, the editorial board are now located in six countries as we speak, uh, and the contributors are you know, of 21 nationalities. So uh, it's hard for me to do that, but I can thank uh, let's not to pay you very for uh, this product. <coughs> and I can only tell you that uh, she became very much involved with this uh, at the very last but very important stages of this work. And this is the kind of my involvement. Uh, it is said that one cannot uh, judge a book by the cover, but, uh, but many people do. And I think uh, even the cover corresponds to the content. It's a beautiful, beautiful work. I thank you for that. And I can immediately thank, even though in his absence, <coughs> our Vice Chancellor, Suraj Kumar, uh, both for his wonderful words, you know, uh, uh, I'm so used to it, he's such a gentle man and so, so generous with his, his, credit, his, his um, compliments, but I have to give it back to him, uh, because he, in this project, like many projects, reached the moment of success. And yet, I think we were close to a long gestation period become part of this project, and he immediately responded positively, that's of his want, and involved, uh, uh, involved uh, uh, Jindal in the project, so made all, made all the difference, <coughs> uh, and that was the, the results that you've seen before us. Well, I'm going to make sure that I uh, cover this so carefully, because that's such a high standard to me in the book itself. So speaking about my thoughts, I, I, I put in my mind in my mind, uh, But <clears throat> I think uh, I would just follow on what I said about Rash Kumar, you know, the what, well, the way this the way he took this project on, and the words that he spoke, and the, the, the way that he put this book in the context of our work here. Is just one more example of why I'm so honored to be associated with him and, and the general and I know all of you share this with me. And of course, I make my immediate thanks to uh, Professor Vesta uh, and our colleagues, Professor Whitney, who asked me to treat it. And I think all the authors that you mentioned will be really proud of their, what you said about them, even if you would disagree with us. But our great minds often differ, as you know. Um, and I have to add, 
this is something that I would have said <coughs> with more emphasis uh, that uh, I've had uh, see Rashford Martin with us. His alma mater, one of the, one of the daughters that is involved with this project, is now <coughs> with his study at his alma mater uh, at, at Harvard. And I can tell you now that the, what we saw today, and what we saw <coughs> generally you know, with other colleagues from the center, we could easily put up five or six people that we be able to so, uh, teach international law at the highest level. And to support the research in international law. Whereas my daughter there was unable to find a single senior professor able to give her advice on her master's thesis. So, this is the one, I mean, this is why it's, if Raj Kumar was talking about turning this into a center of international law in India, it, it is a world center to be prepared for. Uh, well, uh, there's a tendency to be, <coughs> a tendency to be uh, modest when one sees and listens to all, read, sees his writing and listens to all his traits. I will not, uh, I will not fall into that temptation because if you look carefully and listen carefully what the have been said, you will see that we're not talking about any individual contribution, individual accomplishments at all stages along the way. It's because of the cooperation with colleagues that. Uh, to lead this very, very successful results of it, I have to say so. And, uh, and to, uh, begin on the, uh, the social front, uh, I've been blessed in my own country and other endeavors to have excellent people beside me uh, as I'm uh, doing these things. And I have to add to you, Lester, uh, the reason why uh, I am uh, uh, a national champion <laughs> in tennis. The reason why I'm a national champion in tennis, uh, well, one reason is because usually the second question is how many people play tennis in Iceland when I say I'm a national champion. But anyway, that's my agenda there. Uh, the other reason why I'm a national champion is because this was in doubles, in one case mixed doubles, and my my partner, my my sister, happens to be the West women's player. So as you know, it's always the women that are necessarily weekly. All I have to do is Forward. And secondly, uh, my second national championship was in, <coughs> in uh, uh, men's doubles, and my son was, with, well, he's like 30 years younger than I am, he was playing with me. He's one of the excellent, the best players in the country. So even in these uh, accomplishments so far, they are very much a joint accomplishment. And then, of course, the same thing goes with basketball. Of course, you cannot win a basketball game by yourself. Uh, <coughs> But this extends all, has also extended into my professional life. I have absolutely blessed by people that you mentioned two or three of them. They, they worked with me and we worked together on all these, uh, uh, these projects. Uh, James Crawford, uh, Hans Terrell. And, uh, and from the Icelandic side, I have been involved in hundreds of negotiations, all the way to have someone on my side who was helping me, providing me expert information that I could not have in all these fields. And this is why it's very interesting to hear uh, what Professor uh, what Judge Tomko is saying, particularly about the way research, because I know nothing about Wales, but I've spent my whole you know, 10 years of my life. I could probably not exactly tell you the difference between one and the other, but to my side, I have a world best expert to whisper in my ear at the appropriate time. And then I uh, mentioned also uh, Magdalena Sepulveda, that is very, just to show you how our global world is so short, so small. Uh, 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 Magdalena was the person who co-founded co with me the uh, international law program at the at University of the Peace. And here I find, you look at this book. I open the book. On the first page of her article, the first book you want to see Raj Kumar. I didn't know they knew each other, but they've known each other for years. Just one more example of our, our, our profession. I mean, <coughs> uh, well, we had some talk about the comments. You know, this experience that, that was described there was uh, very interesting because you'll find one of the things that characterizes international uh, uh, negotiations is the language is so disparate. I'm not saying that in the UN, of course, we have six official languages, but most people speak other languages. And you've got people with, you know, 
heavens to 20 different languages, different approaches to language. And very difficult to arrive at agreement. So you're sitting in this conference in group, you know, in the English language group, you're not even talking about you know, the other language groups. People, you know, and they get most worried about things like punctuation and grammar. Everyone has to put their own little views about this. So the idea was when we were doing this process, uh, Bernie Oxman, uh, an American delegate, and our professor at, at Miami said, okay, this form, we'll ask uh, Michael Wood uh, and uh, Bernie Wood to do this. And they just whenever we had a problem, they pass it off to us. <coughs> And, uh, you know, and that's an example. We worked very well together, English and, and basically American and, and my English, but together, we put together no problems. Uh, and uh, uh, Mike, so Michael, we, we tried to approach him. I remember, I, I tried to see if he could confirm it. I remember that we had done all our work, and then at the very final uh, uh, day, I made a proposal. There's, a, there's, a, there's an article in the convention which says, refers to so-called and then inverted commas, historic comma, past inverted comma day. So I said to myself, it's either so-called historic day or it's quote historic days. And we were sad by that because we were getting into substance. But Michael Wood doesn't understand, doesn't remember uh, that way. Well, uh, I was so the, the examples we met, my, the, two, the two daughters who were on the, uh, the uh, on the, the editorial committee, they grew up with this uh, concern about precision. And one of the, uh, the uh, uh, criteria that uh, Judge Lesson, uh, Professor Lesson mentioned was impeccable editing. And I think that I'm sure as a producer, uh, 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 as the uh, publisher, you're very proud of that aspect of it. But the, both these girls worked very closely with you uh, to in editing the national, international law section of the Icelandic Gazette. So you can imagine what that requires. Hundreds of pages of work, millions of comments. And when, so they used to, you know, from a very young age, like 10 or 12, they were reading out the text to me just to check to see, because I'm translating, you know, checking translations in the Icelandic language. And they would always say, uh, there were four, five, there were four, 48 uh, uh, six sections. Comma, where normal people would just read it through. Was important. They have to be respected. So, and I was very proud. One of, one of my colleagues who wrote me and said, "Ruth was captured from New Mexico." He wrote me and said, "Listen, I have this great experience with your daughter. I won't tell you what it is, but she is one of the best editors I've ever experienced." So, uh, I can be proud of her. But this is my, this is my, you know, professional life. But um, I have to say that the very daughters we're talking about. And our son as well, so it certainly suffered from this, so to say, wide range of our activities. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, sometimes, you know, they get very seldom have you know, formal, uh, uh, formal, uh, you know, family holidays where they try to stick it in with, with our, our work. And, I mean, one time we were, we were going to get away, but one time we went to a farmhouse in my son, which there was no communications uh, at all. And we had the four, we were there for like, a day, and the poor farmer, 60 kilometers away, was had been called by the ministry to go on his horse to fetch me and send me off to a meeting in, in Moscow as a term. So we had half a day of vacation in the middle of nowhere and off we go. That was the life they lived. But I think they haven't they have not held it against me as you can see by their contribution to this <laughs> to this work. But I have to add at the very end that uh, uh, you know the Unfortunately, my wife is not able to be there uh, because she fell ill last night. But everything that I, everything we read about in this uh, in this uh, uh, book uh, is, is owed to uh, you know my life partner. And, and, <coughs> Sacrifices that she had to make. I mean, she, would, she lived a normal life, a very great career, <coughs> and, but at the same time, in fact, she had she attained four university uh, degrees during our time together. So she wasn't sitting idly by while I was working on these things. Cool. But uh, uh, that's something you mentioned uh, <coughs> that um, uh, in a small population.
welfare issue country, you would have to do a lot of things. And uh, you know, they, they did everything in the right and so forth. And, 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 and I think that in particular is great to see my, my wife uh, uh, holding my hand through those times of anxiety when I clearly had taken on, bitten off more than I could chew. It was a very important fault to this success in my life. So uh, the Libra and the Corps, the, 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 the book of plants, my wife did not contribute to that one. It's, it's a book, but she is my whatever that's name. And I, even though I can't talk personally, you know, technically it's not my book, dedicated to the I want to dedicate it. 